shark, swallow you whole. I value my neck a lot more than 3,000 bucks, Chief. I'll find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for ten. Ten thousand dollars for me by myself. For that you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. You yell shark, we've got a panel on our hands on the 4th of July. Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, I pulled a tooth the size of a shot glass out of the wreck hull of the boat out there, and it was the tooth of a great white. A what? You're gonna need a bigger post. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? you Get your name into the National Geographic. Now, I'm not saying that this is not the shark. It probably is, Martin. It probably is. It's a man-eater. It's extremely rare for these waters. But the fact is that the bite radius on this animal is different than the wounds on the victim. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Did Quint fire four barrels into the shark or only three? Well, to tell you the truth in all the excitement, I kind of lost track myself. But being that this is Jaws, the greatest movie ever made, you've got to ask yourself one question. Am I going crazy? No, you're not going crazy. You are back here in the Jaws Obsession for a 68th episode, where, as always, we are here to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. Thank you for returning for episode 68, Three Barrels or Four. This is a question that has been raised by listeners to this broadcast. Many assume that it's a continuity error, but it is not. And we are going to dive into the details later in this episode. And we're going to solve this riddle of three barrels or four. It's been close to three weeks since our last episode, but there is a reason for it. We have a major announcement to make. This is the moment we've all been waiting for out there in the Jaws Obsession. That can only mean one thing. When you hear the Quint theme come on this show, that means something major has just happened. It is my honor and pleasure to announce that the book of Quint is now going to be published. It is going to have a worldwide publication. The book of Quint has been acquired by Amberley Publishing out of the United Kingdom. Amberley Publishing will now take its rightful place in the Jaws timeline, in Jaws history. And the Book of Quint will be the first novel to be published in the Jaws universe in 35 years. What an exciting time. This is a monumental time. It's, this, is, uh, this is the moment that so many have waited for. This is a moment that we have worked hard for. And let's just take a moment to bask in the glow that we will know that the rest of the world, the, the world will have access to the Book of Quint this year in the year 2023. So how did this all come about? Well, let's, let's, let's break it down. Let's, let's go down to, let's talk, first let's, let's mention Amberly Publishing. We can't thank enough, I can't thank enough Nick Hayward, CEO of Amberly Publishing, for stepping up and signing the Book of Quint and allowing us to be part of the Amberly Publishing lexicon. 
that uh, that the Book of Quint will now go forward as a historical fiction novel uh, in into the traditional publishing world. This is not something to be taken lightly. This does not happen every day. Traditional publishing world, there is a lot of competition out there. And uh, Nick Hayward, the CEO of Amberley Publishing, to take a chance on a debut novelist to realize that there is an expanded Jaws universe out there and a dedicated fan base ready to support what we have been doing here, what we have been building here for over three years now. We can't thank him enough. We have to also recognize the intrepid sales manager, Dave Bowen. He was one of the early Book of Quint backers. He was able to initiate this drive and bring everyone together. Without Dave, this would never have been possible. When we look back on this time, there are going to be, there are so many people to thank. It's going to take more than one episode to recognize all the help along the way to get to this moment. We also have to thank Benchley IPLLC for the opportunity to tell this story and bring us all closer to Peter Benchley's characters. It all starts with Peter Benchley, remember, to actually stay on the Peter Benchley timeline. So he's already done with the manuscript to Jaws in 73, 74, it goes into publication. Here we are mirroring that in that same way that the Book of Quint was limited, you know, published in a limited capacity in 2022 and in 2023, we are going to reach publication and worldwide status. So we are on that Peter Benchley timeline because remember, we have a feature film in development on the Book of Quint that is still going on, and it still is a possibility to stay on that timeline where why can't we have a prequel to Jaws on cinema screens in 2025 for the 50th anniversary of Jaws? It's all still there. It's all still possible. It's remarkable. And, and it's, it's amazing when you sit back and you take it all in. So one of, the, one of the main players in this story is going to have to be John Tedder. He was the technical advisor for the Book of Quint. And I wanted to bring him on the show at this moment because, boy, uh, John, you and I, we were kind of here. We were, it, it feels like that we are at the, uh, not the end, but we are definitely over the crest of a mountaintop or a roller coaster hill at this point, um, with Amberly Publishing acquiring worldwide rights to the book, book of Quint. I think we've come a long way since our initial four hour conversation in a Went Dixie parking lot. It's uh, been a long time coming. <laughs> it sure has. That, and we're talking way back in December of 2021. Um, mm -hmm. That's when the process of the Jaws obsession started. And there was still, there was a process going, I all the research and then the notes and I started the writing process. But the Jaws obsession was a very important part of the puzzle. Why was it important? I had no idea. I just knew it had to be started. It was not a coincidence that I wanted to do the SDU 5E strobe light, that infamous episode two of the Jaws obsession with Hooper's Neo Flasher strobe, which actually comes into play in this episode later on. We got in touch through that because you still make the labels for that strobe light on your Etsy shop at Quince Shark and Shack over at Etsy.com. You were the first person, I was an outsider outside of my family that I was able to communicate what my intentions were with the Book of Quint. I want to thank you for your steadfast presence, not at that, not just at that time with the writing and how you came on as a technical advisor to the writing of the Book of Quint, but at, in the show as well. I think you gave the validity because we really needed the fans to uh, get behind this project right from the start, and you were able to help that happen. I have to thank you for that. What are your thoughts about Amberly Publishing, them taking a risk on an upstart uh, debut novelist, a 400-plus page book? Because this was a one-in-a-million shot. It really was. Well, first, Ryan, really, I got to say thank you for bringing me on to the project itself. You know, before you ever said anything to me about it, I I was just a real small time guy, you know, just doing a fan service. And then you got in contact with me, <clears throat> like you'd said, and it's gone from there. You know, as far as everything that's going on with Amberly and everything, you know, it's, we always knew this book was a winner. We always knew that, that, that was never a doubt right. in our minds. Absolutely. It, it goes back to that saying that you and I had over the course of many nights, it only takes one. It only takes one. And Amberly they took the risk yeah. and they see that this book has massive potential, not just in one book, but into the beyond. 
they see that. This yeah. book is a winner. It clearly is. They, they wouldn't be willing to do this if it wasn't. What's happened here is that with the Jaws obsession and with your contributions to this, we've effectively established that there is an expanded universe in that movie Jaws. You just have to mm -hmm. sift through the details to find it. it the, the book of Quint actually becomes integral to that equation. What do you think going forward? Do you think that Jaws will be enhanced as readers around the world get their hands on the book of Quint? Absolutely. It's going to be more than enhanced. They're going to have an entirely new perspective on Jaws and the character of Quint himself. It's not just the fleshing out of a character that builds up to a, a movie that we all know and love. It, it's more than that. It's it's the start of the Jaws universe, the Jaws lexicon. It's It's going to be big, and I think the fans are ready for that. And this is the start. We always said it was it was like a slow ticking of a roller coaster going up the hill, up the hill. Mm -hmm. Once you once you hit that crest and you go down, everything starts flying fast. Everything is fluid on the ground. This episode was going to be one way last week, and then it was going to be a different way on Friday, and then it's going to be a different way today. So it's just so interesting. We have no idea where we are going to be a year from now. That's what's amazing. I That's what, It's exciting. It's exciting. You know, it's 50th anniversary of Jaws is coming up. It doesn't have to be just a re-release or a reissue. There's, right. th there's, there's an energy here and an excitement that's surrounding this that was there during the making of Jaws, and there's something else happening here. Sometimes it just seems like, you know, a lot of people, when they're, they're from the outside looking in, they, they're not on the ground factory floor, they, they didn't see, you know, all the nights that you and I just talked on the phone because about how frustrating everything could be mm -hmm. about just the different things going on. They, they weren't there for those hour long conversations. All the times where we had to put our heads together and figure out, okay, where do we go from here and how do we get here? Yeah. Cause it wasn't as, it wasn't a B line. It wasn't a simple case of you go from A to B. You had to go to, a point and a half to then be, you know, we had to do all this back and forth thing and going uphill, downhill, you know, just to, you know, get one thing done and jump through all these hoops. But now that we're here, we're on the precipice. It's unbelievable. It's really unbelievable. Of course, we always knew we'd get that we'd right. get here. I'm trying to quantify the, um, the details here. The book of Quinn is by definition, it has already had a limited publication with the Indiegogo campaign. They had a 300 book limited edition publication back in October of 2022. This is going to be the first worldwide publication of a novel in the Jaws universe, in the Jaws lexicon of a fictional mm -hmm. novel in 35 years since Hank Searle's Jaws the Revenge. I want to isolate on that energy of the moment that this is exciting. This is not um, this is not something that was always a foregone conclusion. It wasn't. And Amberly Publishing just comes through. And as we're seeing now, already with the pre-order links, Amazon UK, Amazon France, there's book vendors in, I, I saw a German website in the European markets and in the UK are having access to pre-orders already. So shortly, we're going to be lateraling that over to North America with a November release date. What do you think the fans can look forward to in November of 2023? The fans of Jaws that are following this and that will be following this and that will be listening to this episode a year down the line, just the excitement that all of this should bring every Jaws fan is monumental because it's like you said in 35 years there's not been another jaws related book or a jaws book under the moniker jaws period released in 35 years this will be the first one every jaws fan site facebook group page website anything else should be reporting on this because this is legitimate jaws news it's the first one in 35 years the universe itself the jaws universe is being expanded, it's growing, and it's being told. And the, and the Jaws fans, they have coming to them so much that they, they're going to be overwhelmed in a good way. They're going to have plenty of content to keep them busy for a while. Yes, and it always dials back to it enhances your enjoyment of the original mm -hmm. movie, of Jaws and Jaws 2, 
I mean, going forward, we're going to be incorporating more of Jaws 2 into the Jaws obsession here. But John, you're on, you're in this for the long haul. I know you are. I am. And I think everybody that reads the book of Quint is in this for the long haul as well. Um, and that's why I think that 2024 and beyond is just going to be so special to see what happens, not just with the book of Quint, but with the new discussions, the new friendships we will make by meeting people, mm-hmm. by coming together. This, the, the book of Quint will draw people together. Wow. Just universal. It's all there. <laughs> it's all there, isn't it, John? It is. And, you know, it's like I said, I do not remember what episode it was that I actually said this on. Ryan probably does. But I, I made the statement that Universal, if you like money, this is the way to go. This is it. Episode 19. You said that on uh, with the fate of the Orca. There you go. Episode 19, fate of the Orca. So, yeah, I told you all you'd know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, Universal, if you like money, this is the way to go. And I still stand by that. This is the way forward. There's so many p- possibilities. Rebuilding the Orca. Just so many things for fans to enjoy a revitalization of the Jaws franchise in an expanded universe. Doesn't have to be ending at Jaws the Revenge. We can actually mm-hmm. take Jaws 1 and 2 and we can actually build on those two movies and those two, that the, the world that they set. When the Book of Quinn is published, the map of Amity Island is going to be in that book. We're going to talk about how that actually laterals over to Jaws 2. The landmarks, everything is there to actually tie the two movies together. Just exciting stuff. It's exciting stuff. It's, it's that, that equation had, had a solution. And we were like Matt Damon in Goodwill Hunting. We're just on the whiteboard, just scratching out all the different geometrical equations. And there it is. And who would have thought that in the witching hour, in the waning moments of 2023, a publisher would come in and take on the Book of Quint and see it across the world? Oh, I agree. And, you know, you just touched on something, talking about the map. Jones fans all across the world are going to get to see now what Amity Island actually looks like. And we spent a lot of time on that map. We, we did actually did real calculations on to figure out where everything was yeah, and how big this island actually is. And I bring that up because I saw on Facebook the other day in one of the Jaws groups, I do not remember which one, somebody asked, what, is Amity, what does Amity Island look like? The amount of comments throughout there was, was overwhelmingly, it's Martha's Vineyard, but we know canically through the film Martha's Vineyard is its own island because you hear the radio announcers say that there are ferry ferry crossings from Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, and Amity Island. That's correct. So it can't look like Martha's Vineyard. It can't. It's not possible. There never was a vehicle to tie everyone together, to bring Jaws fans from all over together, and where where Jaws fans could surround the, the uh, circle the wagons and say, here is where we start. Uh, other franchises had their original creators, as in Star Wars with George Lucas, or you had Mm -hmm. Mario Puzo with The Godfather, and then Francis Ford Coppola comes in with that. So these, at least those those movies had some sort of cohesion. And unfortunately, that Jaws never had that opportunity for a cohesive narrative. And that is where this publication of the Book of Quint is going to work wonders as a cohesive narrative. Uh, that's what we're building on. The fans will now have an answer to go to instead of open-ended questions on message boards, which can get, there's a lot of noise. You can lose the answer in all the noise and it can be lost in the weeds. Uh, there are many different versions of people see the movie in many different ways. And I Very think, true. and I think that this is just fun. I'm not saying that uh, as a fan, this is the fun part is that, Hey, Surrender yourself to an expanded Jaws universe and have fun with it. We don't have to sit there and say we are right, our way or the highway. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that there's more to the story than what we see in the upfront narrative of Jaws. And if we look at the details, there's more to build on there. There's a lot more meat on the bone. And that's why I think that we have come back to this movie Time after time after again, over 50 years, sold out screenings, revitalized screenings, revivals, people building orca models on their desk, because it's, it's the, that close encounters of the third kind. You're building a mountain out of mashed potatoes and you're going, why Mm -hmm. am I doing this? There's something drawing me here. 
And that's where, because the, the way Jaws is told and shown and how it's masterfully created, there's more going on there that we are not privy to. So we are drawn back to it. We're drawn back to that. And that's what this expanded Jaws universe, the Book of Quint is the start of all of that as it's, we're, we're giving something that people can say, that's why I was drawn there. We're making it tangible. Instead of something that they go, there's something more there, they can actually put their fingers on it and they can feel it and they can see it and read it now. Very exciting. It's a very exciting time. That and there's so many unanswered questions within the Jaws universe from Jaws 1 and 2. It's a, I don't want to equate it to the to the Bible, but it's a very similar thing. If you can crack the book open, you can find out all these answers. And Especially going forward from here, you'll be able to do the same thing. It seems that every reader that has received or read the Book of Quint across the world, we're talking many countries, many different countries, would, mm-hmm. would, would agree with you on that, is that it just feels right. And Jaws fans are very particular. We, we, are. we really, we grew up with this movie. This movie is, uh, it's, it's not supposed to be remade. It's not supposed to be preyed upon. It's supposed to be held in the highest regard. And I think that when people are reading the Book of Quint, they actually feel that as well, as much as I was when I was writing it and researching it with yourself. John, so we're going to be bringing you back on a future episode. Oh, yeah. You know, we, John, I want to tell everybody just a hint that John has, through his intrepid investigation techniques, he has acquired probably one of the best Jaws archaeological finds of all time. That's in my opinion. Shortly, and, and he is going to reveal that on the Jaws obsession in a, in a in a very future episode. Might be the next episode. It might be two episodes from now. But uh, John, how are we looking on that? Do you think you have things lining up? Yeah, uh, things are lining up. Uh, should uh, pick up this archaeological artifact that uh, to quote Indiana Jones, it belongs in a museum. Mm-hmm. Uh, this Saturday should be picking it up. So. Oh man, uh, we're gonna the Jaws obsession. <clears throat> the Jaws obsession is going to be introducing introducing a bit of evidence that that is a solid fact, and we're gonna show you how it's a solid fact of something that has been a long question about what a particular thing was. We, we're gonna be introducing a piece of knowledge to the Jaws community that nobody else knows outside of you and I <clears throat> and one other person. And it's going to knock the socks off the Jaws community. Factual evidence and proof yes. about this. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's groundbreaking. I'm excited. I can't wait for it because I, I'm i learning. As, as you discover, you're teaching me, and it's great to learn these aspects. So everybody, I'm telling you, the Jaws obsession is only going to, uh, have the, the glow is only going to increase as we move forward. So... John, as always, you're you're always welcome on the show, and having you here has been educational, and it was great, I think, just to have your voice. I think the listeners will agree. Just to have you on this episode after the big announcement, Amberly Publishing, acquiring the Book of Quint, I think it's all fitting. It's kind of coming full circle. It's tying everything up in a nice little bow. It's always an honor to come on, buddy. All I right. love it. How inspiring is it to see where all of this where, how far we have come on this journey. I realize that in today's day and age, we sometimes uh, we lose patience because everything is so instantaneous. When you want to recall uh, a TV show or a theme that you might want to hear, you just pull it up on YouTube or Netflix. Everything is given to us instantaneously. And so when we are put in positions where you have to play the long ball, you actually have to run the marathon, not the sprint. I understand that that um, uh, tension can build, negative thoughts can can come up. This journey, and we are still on this journey. This is not by any means the end. What we are still on this journey is that um, I was I was feeling some. Uh, there was definitely there, there were definitely some tension because the uh, that others had access to the Book of Quint and that um, it was being held back. And it was all done for a reason, because the traditional publishing for the publisher to uh, invest their time and their efforts into a novel, they they have to have worldwide rights to that novel. That's why the book had to be withheld for this moment. It was a process. This whole thing was a process. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for your patience 
even though uh, in past episodes I've been talking about the Book of Quint and you have not been able to read it, and even now we're going to I'm going to read emails, I'm going to read a review of the Book of Quint, um, that it is coming and that you will be able to uh, pre-order it and it will be delivered to you. It will be in your hands by November 2023, especially before the holidays, before Christmas 2023. This is excellent. This is unbelievable. The vision is being realized. Uh, The stage is being set. It's a stage that Quint needs to be on to thrive. Uh, The character of Quint needs the biggest stage possible, right? This is Robert Shaw. In my opinion, Robert Shaw's greatest performance. It's the biggest stage possible he needs. And traditional publishing is such a stage for this moment. Without readers, what good is the novel? And now this book will be delivered to readers around the world with much more access than the self-publishing world. One one other small little thought that I'm just processing here is uh, Jaws affected me greatly in my youth. I remember reading it for a book report in second grade. Of course, I skipped the middle section. I had no idea what was going on with the dinner party scene and, you know, the the dalliances going on in that part two of the novel. I always just focused on part one and then, of course, the part three. So it's something about the sea. It's something about sharks. It's The, the whole thing was just, it, it wrapped me up. And it did that for millions of people out there. You yourself listening, we are all here because of the magic of that novel. What I see is, uh, going forward, this is about the children, the, the newer generations. Jaws continues to inspire through the Book of Quint. And it's from this process, it's from the, these, this, this broadcast of the Jaws obsession. Um, it's a lesson for my children. It's a lesson for the younger generations out there that hard work will still produce results. If you put your whole heart and mind into something, you can achieve great things. Such a lesson for generations to come, that it still happens, it still works, that the the dream can be realized. But this is, was about, I could not do this myself. This is not about one man at a typewriter. I always, I grew up thinking that's what novelists were. Uh, the Hemingway at a typewriter just uh, tapping away on the on the keys. It's not. It's not. I've learned so much from this process that it is not a solo sport by any means. Uh, you you might be the conduit that the story flows through to get out there, but if it wasn't for the people coming together from Agent Bill Pettit, from all the people on the show that were able to add validity to what we have been doing here, it goes on and it continues to go on. Marty Milner, I can't thank Marty Milner enough on episode 50. I listened to episode 50 again. Just the faith of a man that was on set, the construction foreman of Jaws, and how the the words, the positive words and the review he gave to the Book of Quint back in December, it just set everything in motion going all the way through this year, the ups and downs, the you know, the the highs and the lows. And here we are, Hayden Wheeler, who organized with Chris the West Houghton Robert Shaw meetup, where we put the Book of Quint into the libraries up in West Houghton, Greater Manchester area. That was where I met Dave Bowen, started the process, taking the book to Amberley. There's so many, there's so many names and people of course, Sean O'Rourke, who did the um, who did the unboxing of the Book of Quint earlier this year. Scott Fitzgerald, that great appearance after Christmas in 2022 on his uh, positive blathering appearance. That's still you can still find that on YouTube. All those moments were needed in order to get to the next step. It's like climbing the rungs of a ladder, and you just keep going up, going up, going up until we finally are at that destination. It's a lesson for my children going forward hard work pays off and that if you do something 100% results can be achieved in any career. It's not just writing. It's in, it's in anything. And uh, it's great to see. We have an ISBN number now for the book of Quinn. It's official. The ISBN number 1398122475. That is going to be the number that you can look up the book of Quint in any market that you're in. So let's talk about going forward, what to expect. There's new info every day right now. In the last three days, new sites have picked the book up. 
There's new ways to pre-order. I'm seeing sites in France, in Germany, of course, the UK now listing. The Book of Quint is listed on various sites in the UK, Amazon UK, and other local bookstores. This is an opportunity to go out to your local bookstore and say, I want to pre-order the Book of Quint. Give the local bookstore some business. Books are still an important part of our society, of our of human to human contact. As it stands now, the Book of Quint is going to be released. This is going to be a trade paperback release of the Book of Quint. November 15th, 2023 is the date that I'm seeing on many sites. Uh, that is what Amberley Publishing is releasing at this time. If you are in the UK, you have seen listings of it already. The US and North America. Uh, we're standing by. Logistics and planning is being made. So at this time, it will be released in North America in November of 2023, and we will have pre-order capabilities. It's just that it hasn't been set up yet. It has to filter through the system, go in through those distribution channels. A little bit of a delay there, but as always, I will keep you up to date here on the JAWS Obsession. If you look at bookofquint.com, jawsob.com, and, and also the latest and greatest you can always follow over at Instagram at Book of Quint over on Instagram. That's where we're keeping everybody together. Everybody is up to date over there if you follow the book over there. So we have a lot of channels to stay in touch, to stay as a community, to stay grouped together. Uh, the key date, once again, it's to focus on is November 15th, 2023. Uh, one more thing I wanted to mention. I mean, I'm just, I, I'm kind of just in the moment. I'm just, uh, I have so many thoughts going through my head. Uh, one of the things is right here on my desk, I've kept through this whole process. I have the ticket stubs from the ferry ride over to Martha's Vineyard from Hyannis on Cape Cod. The initial ferry ride, I have the date of August 26, 2020. Um, that is where it all started. There was two trips over to Martha's Vineyard during the research phase of the Book of Quint, but the first trip, that one from August 26, 2020, was when um, I had the first inspirations that there was something more going on, that Jaws was not just a movie. It was the greatest movie of all time, but there's something more there. I could not put my finger on it, but there was more to the story. And I felt that, and that's what made me go back, and that's when I met Mike Currid, and we went on that fateful tour with the Edgartown Tour Company, and we went to all the Jaws locations. It just hit me like a ton of bricks. There was the, the Quint backstory was real, and it was right there in front of me. So I've kept these tickets on my desk here through that whole process. We are three years and one month over that date, uh, almost three years and one month to the date. Yeah, so, and I try to put myself back into the mindset back then where there were so many doubts that this was not a foregone conclusion. Uh, there, there is a lot of soul searching that happens um, when you decide to put yourself out there. Um, of course, there's always fear of failure, and then there's the fear of regret. I believe failures can be overcome. Failure is how we learn to move ahead. That's what life is all about. It's what, what you know, the, 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 it's the great Rocky line, uh, Sylvester Stallone. What is that line? The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. That is exactly how I felt in anything I've done in my, in my life. Failure is always the option and it's always going to be there in anything that we do. And I remember back in August of 2020, that first instinct is to run away and say, no, no, it's a crazy idea. Don't do it. It's that life is all about failing and getting back up. And these are one of those moments where you just become resilient to it. And this last three years, the book of Quint was denied uh, quite a few times also from, from various agents and then by many, many publishers. 
And to, in order to get back up and keep going, I was talking to Nick and Chelsea, two friends of mine, this last Sunday. And uh, Chelsea used to work in the publishing world down in New York City. And she said that the resilience, they know the process, and the resilience to keep getting back up, to keep moving forward, even in the face of all, that's a, what you have to do as an author, but it's what you have to do in all of life, in all sorts of industries. Everyone listening here um, has knows what it's like to get denied, get turned down, and you just got to keep moving forward, that, that this novel is not just a novel. There's something more behind it. There's a community that came together and that it, to see it go forward, to see it actually achieve the impossible, the seemingly, the statistically Im improbability of what we're doing here, of what we are overcoming here, is monumental. And it should not be, it should not be understated. And that's why I continue to keep these ticket stubs right here under one of the monitors on my desk to remind me of where this process started because that is how that is my process of how I keep going forward is I always constantly try to remember where I came from. So goes life. It's better to face the possibility of failure than to face years of regret that you did not give it a shot. And that's what the lessons that we can learn from this process is I hope to inspire the younger generations that they can actually see this as something bigger than just a novel that people came together to actually realize and bring into reality. And I want to thank you for allowing me to relay that message, these thoughts to you uh, for this episode 68. Let's switch gears here and jump over to the emails. Since the last episode was at the end of August, we've had quite a number of emails coming in. So I wanted to try to get caught up um, as always, I like to respond to everybody who writes in to me at the show here at JawsOB2025 at gmail.com. So maybe we could catch up on some of these emails on the show because these are some really good questions, some observations that are coming in. It's always great to hear from listeners to the show as uh, fans of Jaws or readers of the Book of Quint. Book of Quint reader and a longtime listener to the show, Kevin, says, Hey, Ryan, how you doing? My daughter, Brooke, and I went to see The Shark is Broken in New York City today. Uh, it was tremendous and very well written. I know you have seen the play too. We waited after the show and were able to get Ian Shaw to take a picture with us and sign our playbills. He was very humble and sincerely nice to everyone. Hope all is well with you and your pursuit of a major book deal. The Jaws obsession has been great and I look forward to each episode. Keep up the great job and God bless. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for that email. He sent a picture and there's Ian Shaw. What a nice gentleman Mr. Shaw is. And it's great to see him meeting the fans and giving the uh, uh, stateside, the United States, a chance to see him in that play over there on Broadway, taking pictures, selfies, signing stuff, uh, signing items for fans. It's just, he's such a great ambassador for Jaws and the Shaw family. Thanks for sharing that with us, Kevin. Yeah, for anyone interested in the scene, Ian Shaw as his father on the set of Jaws, you go to The Shark is Broken. It's at the Golden Theater at 252 West 45th Street. They still have, they are still going strong, and they're going to be going strong all the way until November 19th. If you go to thesharkisbroken.com, that will send you to all the links to get tickets address, information, and everything to navigate your way to Broadway to go see Ian Shaw uh, portray Robert Shaw on the set of Jaws. It's a wonderful play. Jaws fans are flocking to it. It's great to see all the, um, the, rea all the reactions on Instagram and throughout the media. So be sure, if you have the opportunity, I highly recommend going to see um, the live stage play The Shark is Broken. Next email up, we have Adam. Adam writes in, uh, Adam is from the UK. He writes in, he says, hello, I just wanted to say a big thank you for the excellent podcast. I am from England and I have been avidly listening whilst on an amazing holiday in Mauritius. Every evening I go out to watch the sunset into the sea and take photographs while listening to another thrilling episode. I can't think of another film I could so enthrallingly absorb such incredible attention to detail. 
the fact I can listen to such a microscopic biopsy of this perfect piece of cinema for free is a complete and utter privilege. Thanks again, Adam. Wow, Adam, great. That's all. Adam, thank you so much for the compliment. Uh, all the way out there, uh, Mauritius is an island off of Africa, off of Madagascar. He's out there, and he listens to an episode uh, during sunsets. He says it's a it's a privilege that he can listen to. Uh, what did he say? He he describes it as a such a microscopic biopsy of this perfect piece of cinema for free. That's great. Yes, yes, and that's a, it's great to see Jaws fans enjoying around the world, no matter where you are. This is this is the era we live in that we can be brought together like this, this broadcast. That's why I, I frequently mention this as a broadcast, because it is, in the most accurate sense of the term, it goes across the entire world, and it right to your phone, your device, everywhere, your car, it's there. And it is for free. I have turned down offers for monetization on this show because I want everyone to have access. This it was never about monetization this was about pure love of the movie Jaws. To be going forward, I, I wanted to make less hurdles for people to re, be able to research and get on the same page as everybody else as we expand the Jaws universe. Adam is enjoying that over in the, the island of Mauritius off of the coast of Africa. Isn't that amazing? How amazing is that? That from the Jaws bunker here all the way around the world there we can talk about the greatest movie of all time. Thank you so much, Adam, for writing in. Safe travels to you, sir. Thank you for writing in. We had another email here. Hi, Ryan. I'm an expat Brit living in Poland. I would like to say that what you're doing with your podcast is phenomenal. Ever since the age of eight at the old ABC Cinema in Liverpool, Jaws has been an integral part of my life. Having stumbled upon your podcast, I soon realized that I was not the only one still obsessing about this film over the years. Anyhow, to my point, what happened to the $10,000 bounty? It obviously wouldn't have gone to Quint himself, but what about his estate? Or perhaps it went to Brody and Hooper. Of course, there must have been a process by which somebody received it because the shark surely was killed. Good luck with everything, and I can't wait to get my hands on your book when it's published. Farewell and adieu, Victor Johnson. Oh, well, Mr. Johnson, thank you very much for writing in. That is the, that $10,000 bounty is an extremely important part to the expanded Jaws universe. And those questions are answered in the book of Quint. I don't want to spoil anything by giving away the exact answer of what happens. Everyone that reads about what happens with the $10,000 bounty absolutely says it fits with how it should be. It's just that $10,000 bounty is part of that expanded universe. Why the Book of Quint is important is that we need these so that we can actually better understand the events of Jaws, but, but also the events that come after Jaws. Because we do have Jaws and Jaws 2. Going forward, Jaws and Jaws 2 are going to be what we're operating on. Three and four are going to have to be set aside because there are um, there are continuity and timeline differences in three and four. You can't explain those, and those kind of disrupt the narrative. So one and two are going to be the, the tentpole movies that the expanded Jaws universe will take off from. But, wow, does that $10,000 bounty play a major role in what is to come? And uh, if when you do get your hands on the Book of Quint, now that it will be published with Amberly Publishing... You will read exactly what happens, and that's great. So Mr. Johnson, so Victor Johnson over in Poland will be on the same page. Certain facts had to be have to be established that aren't necessarily explained in Jaws. And it's exciting and, and it will be exciting to see uh, all come together. It's it's as if we are putting together a jigsaw puzzle and those pieces are all clicking in and they all fit. When they all fit together and then you stand back and you look at the big picture, you just it's wonderful to see. And it's going to increase your enjoyment of not just Jaws, but Jaws 2 as well. And thank you for writing in, Victor, and thank you for your compliments on the show. I had a correspondence with Steve in the UK. He wrote, Hi, Ryan. In the week since we traded emails, I have reached episode 61, Ben Gardner's Head. After just over three weeks, I am almost up to date from starting at number one. I see what you mean about the episodes in the 50s and 60s, uh, but to be honest, I have enjoyed them all since the first episode. It has been great hearing each bit of development in your journey with each episode. 
the gaining an agent, the writing of the screenplay, etc., and also hearing all the reviews of the Book of Quint. The flip side is that it has made me mad at myself for not being aware on board this journey from the beginning. As a longtime Jaws mega fan, I am kicking myself for not knowing about the Indiegogo campaign. Born late 1965, I was 10 when it opened in UK cinemas, Christmas 1975, when I saw it for the first time. I'm going to stop right there. Steve, don't be disappointed that you were not here from the beginning. Um, there, This has been a slow build. We have not had the time to work the social media. That was the weak link of the Jaws obsession, that we had to let word of mouth spread it around. And social media was not my strong point because of all the hats that had to be worn, for, not just from the broadcast, but from the writing and then the, and all that stuff, the negotiating and all the contacting. If you look at what happened is, if you are introduced now, we have new listeners every day are coming to the Jaws Obsession and they're finding out, wow, I, now I have 68 episodes to get through. But it's what happens is, is that the impact, when you stand back and look at it, and that's a lot of dedication. Steve actually recently just finished all episodes within a month. And that's a lot of dedication. There's almost four days of content. If you listen to the Jaws Obsession back to back, you can listen to four days nonstop. It's all Jaws talk. That's amazing dedication right there. But what happens is, is that you are, you are just walloped with this feeling on a massive scale. And I, I really think that that worked out great because the people that are introduced to the Jaws, to the Book of Quint today, are going to find that the Jaws obsession is a perfect addendum to the novel, that it backs it up even more. A lot of times we read a book and that's, that's it. That's all you have. And they say, well, I hope it comes becomes a movie. And then you kind of wait on Hollywood to get in motion because everything is slow over in Hollywood. But with this, we have a conduit, which is the Jaws obsession, to investigate and study further the intricacies of not just Jaws, but the Book of Quint as well. And that's what is really amazing about this is it, I, I wanted nothing less for Jaws, the greatest movie of all time, should have something this extensive. And it was great to build this. And even though you came in late in the stage, it's great having you here and that you were able to use your time and you dedicated your time to research and get all of that content in. And, and I thank you for that dedication. Steve continues to write. He says, I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate you. In the early 2000s, I had my own writing journey, screenplays in my case, and it was very hard. It was like being outside of a club you were not invited to, and I had a lot of rejection. I did well in a number of screenwriting competitions, which led to a meeting with a British film company, and also had interest from an American indie producer, but these led to nothing, and I had to give up writing to protect my mental health. This is why I congratulate you on your perseverance. You obviously have a resilience that I did not have. Well done, mate. All the best, Ryan, for everything you are doing. Steve in South London, England. And Steve is on Instagram, at my Jaws World over on Instagram. Steve, first of all, I ab absolutely understand about giving up to protect your mental health. He says there's a resilience that he did not have. Let's just put it this way, is that I was also, I had a film company in the early 2000s, and I did independent film production. I, there was screenwriting involved. I did write a uh, filmmaking book early on. I wrote articles for various magazines. I understand the resilience that you need, the rejection that happens time after time after again. Door closes, door closes, two more open, you go through those, and two more doors close. So, the mental health, I understand, and that's when I went into the electrical trade and became a lineman because I actually trusted electricity more than I did <laughs> the more to, more than I did the uh, filmmaking world. It was more that electricity could be relied on. Electricity, even though it is scary, you you know how it's going to behave, and if you respect electricity, it it, it follows certain rules, and it's always there, and that is what I. I like that lifestyle. I, I sort of, I like that after the tumultuous and uh, chaotic nature that was the filmmaking world, to be able to have a steady pace, um, to become a professional in that world, it was a mental health break. And I left the writing world for 15 years. I did not, I did not write a th thing. I, I did not write anything for 15 years like this. And that's, and when you say that it's, there's a resilience that you did not have, 
I think that once you reach a level where you're not writing for financial gain and you're writing for because there is something else out there and you need to tell this story, the resilience, the resilience comes from you once you are free of that, uh, the pressure where it is not your career. I reached a level where getting knocked down doesn't mean anything. You just get back up. It's just like the Rocky quote that I pulled from the Sylvester Stallone quote that I played earlier. In this day and age, you can take rejection because there's always a plan B, C, D, and E. There's always an, there's always an avenue in the 21st century to getting it done. That's where the resilience comes from. It's knowing that it would be nice if this happened, but if it doesn't, we always have this road to take. And we did not have that back in the early 2000s. In the 90s, in the early 2000s, you didn't have that. You actually had just even broadcasting, a, a, uh, just even a sound studio or working on editing. You would have to go find an editing suite somewhere. The The offline editing was just coming into its own where you could actually use the, but the hard drive space was limited. Everything was limited back then. So you would have to go to bigger entities and you would have to use their equipment. But now everything is just so streamlined. It's, it, you are empowered. We are empowered as writers, as artists, as individuals to get our vision out there. It's within that mindset that the resilience builds. To answer your question, I thank you for the compliment, but I believe you have that resilience, Steve. I believe everyone out there listening has that resilience now just because you have access to the technology. That's a simple fact of the times that we live in. Thank you very much for writing in, Steve, from South London, England. This is great. A lot of, lot of, British, lot of British readers and potential uh, future readers and a lot of Jaws fans are writing in from the UK. This is great to see. Let's go on to one more. So Doug Coles writes in and he says, I just finished all 67 episodes in order in 20 days. Wow, Doug, that's wild. 67 episodes in 20 days. That's some serious dedication because I know how much content that is. And that's thank you so much for your time there. He says, I'm going to leave you a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or some early thoughts. I have several copies of Jaws on a shelf downstairs in their own place, the Jaws shelf. On August 22nd, I saw that Jaws was free on Tubi. And for whatever reason, I started watching it. Then I thought, hey, we're in the internet age. I'll bet I can learn those knots that Hooper tied and that one that Brody was learning. And lo and behold, I stumbled into a short video by John Tedder showing the trumpet knot that Hooper ties and how to tie a real sheep shank. He mentioned on the video he does work on the Jaws obsession. So I say to myself, hot dog, an obsessive podcast about Jaws and, I, and started listening on Spotify. I went in straight order never peeking ahead to see what the big episode 20 was about. When I heard episode 20 about the Book of Quint, I thought you had a big set of stones on you. I was ambivalent about expanding the universe, but I am now sold, even though I can't read the Book of Quint. And that was Doug Coles in Danbury, Connecticut. He obviously stumbled upon the Orca Rebuild, John's YouTube channel, at Orca Rebuild. And that is where John does videos where here at the Jaws Obsession, we are audio-based. We rarely do any video work. And John has videos over there where he's documenting his Orca rebuild process. But at the same time, he also has uh, small videos about th certain aspects of Jaws and Orca life, which are really informative. I've learned a lot from them. Yeah, that was back in episode 35, Time Me a Sheepshank, uh, where we actually did, went into some of the knot work from the knot tying that is in the movie Jaws. I wonder if this is Doug's comment over on Apple Podcasts. The five-star review is, is by a user, Random Plank. A cigar is never a just a cigar on the Jaws obsession. This podcast gives this masterpiece of a film a thorough going over. Listeners are encouraged to build ideas out of every detail of the film and the host, Ryan, technical advisor, John, and his guests help fill in all those gaps a fascinating world-building exercise that is bringing admirers of Jaws together. What a great five-star comment. All those five-star reviews are extremely helpful in pushing the show out to new listeners. 
over at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, on whatever podcast platform that you are listening on at this time to give us a five-star review and a short review in your own words. It increases the, the notoriety of the show. So we will get recommendations into other listeners' playlists and therefore it spreads the word. Thank you very much, Doug and user Random Plank. Maybe you are the same. And Doug is located in Danbury, Connecticut. So U.S. markets, remember, U.S. markets, we will have pre-order capabilities coming up shortly as Amberly Publishing works that out with the logistics side, since they are a UK-based publisher, the Book of Quint is going to be published through the UK and then be distributed over into North America in November of 2023. So those particulars are being worked out at this time, and we're going to have links shortly. Believe me, you'll hear all about that as the news comes in. Those are all the emails that we have for now. We had a great review come in over at Instagram at Book of Quint. I posted some photos over there of an author from the UK. I believe he's from Leeds. So he co-authored the book, A Fast Moving Beat Show of the Tragic Story of the Final Fatal UK Tour, Eddie Cochran, Summertime Blues. Um, Adrian McKenna was a co-author of that, uh, of that book, and wrote about the and wrote about the life of America rock and roll icon Eddie Cochran and the Scotland shows on his tragic final UK tour. So Adrian is also a Robert Shaw aficionado. He's very well versed, very knowledgeable about Robert Shaw novels and the writings of Robert Shaw. We all know Robert Shaw was a novelist. He was a playwright. Aside from being a great actor, he was very knowledgeable. He he did rewrites on some of the screenplays of movies that he was in, and we do know he had a hand in writing the Indianapolis speech in the movie Jaws. So Adrian then decided to take the ultimate Robert Shaw tour. He went to West Houghton in the greater Manchester area, Bolton in the United Kingdom, and he went into the library there and he checked out the Book of Quint. If you can remember, we did the whole presentation ceremony and back in July which was covered in uh, Jaws Obsession 64, Quint Inspiration. And from there, he not only took the Book of Quint, but he visited the, the, the house where Robert Shaw was born. And then he went to the Robert Shaw Weatherspoon Pub, and he started his reading. And he was able to finish in record time. He, I mean, he finished the book in, in only a matter of days. And now we have a very well-written Book of Quint review that is spoiler-free. So I would like to take this moment to read this review to everyone out there. So now to celebrate the Book of Quint and the announcement that it was acquired for worldwide publication by Amberly Publishing, this review couldn't have come at a better time. So let's get to this a review by Adrian McKenna. Here it goes. The Book of Quint is the debut novel of author Ryan Daco, a fictionalized imagining of the life of one of cinema's most memorable characters, the shark fisherman Quint from Jaws, 1975 vividly portrayed by Robert Shaw. Beginning with a present tense mystery puzzle element, when a young woman arrives on Amity Island to piece together Quint's life, the story flicks back in time to the 1945 sinking of the USS Indianapolis, the event that transformed Quint from loyal Navy sailor into vengeful shark hunter. The slow motion disaster of the sinking and the sanguine aftermath as the sailors cling to cargo nets, flotsam, and life itself the precise details of naval hierarchy and command structure which the sea equalizes, the dismal realization that rescue will not be swift, the merciless marauding sharks picking off the survivors, isn't the cold indifferent indifference of nature its most terrifying aspect? All these elements are precisely realized and told with dynamic, immersive, economical prose. We then follow Quint's adventures chronologically as he wades through a PTSD-affected ex existence, his personality as abrasive as shark skin. Initially, he's fog-bound in San Francisco before a chance encounter leads to an intriguing offer to relocate to a nascent holiday resort, Amity Island. Political intrigues and the murky infusion of money into the island bring additional weight and purpose to the narrative. As the unintended consequences of rampant capitalism, one of the subtext metaphors of the film, play out in full. Ultimately, the book is a sea adventure in classic style. 
The pungent direct flavor of Hemingway's The Old Man in the Sea is notably present where a key memory early in the book foreshadows future events. Jack London's The Sea Wolf is also a style keystone. The titular Quint is reminiscent of London's Wolf Larsen in physicality and self-containment, though happily not in sociopathic tendency. In a further nod to London's book, the author makes full use of a very incidental character in the original film and repurposes the Humphrey Van Wyden trope of a first-person narrator, narrator whose propinquity to a powerful presence transforms meek insignificance into sturdy manhood. It's a smartly utilized literary device which delivers both personal immediacy immediacy to the action and effortless exposition. The book is a sparkling read of trauma, tragedy, stoic resilience, and breathless high adventure. Staying faithful to the film's universe, the author expands the scope of Quint's backstory with great skill, imagination, and brio. Perhaps the book's biggest achievement from a pure story perspective, in the same way that James Cameron achieved with Titanic, is in its ability to hold the reader in rapt attention despite already knowing many of the crucial plot points. Wow, what a review. Thank you very much, Mr. McKenna, Mr. Adrian McKenna, for breaking down the Book of Quint in such a complete way. What a wonderful review. It has been extremely difficult to not talk about the Book of Quint, to not give away any spoilers but to also communicate that the Book of Quint does our guy Quint justice. It gives him the proper stage and the proper gravitas of the moment is seized within this novel. For former readers of the Book of Quint and future readers to rest assured that this, this book is worth your investment in your time, because that is your most valuable asset in this life, is time. It's not infinite. And if you're going to invest your time it should be worthwhile, and the Book of Quint is worth your time. Thank you so much, Mr. McKenna, Adrian McKenna, for writing that review. I was beside myself when I read that this morning, so I had to work it into the show. Thank you so much for that review. Let's get back to Jaws. Why are we here with the Jaws obsession? Let's dive into three barrels or four. This was a question that was brought up by a few listeners to the show, and I knew I had to get to this topic eventually. I had an email from Chris who said, Hi Ryan, I do not know if you have covered this in your past episodes, but I wanted to bring this topic up and see where it takes us. During the barrel sequence, it shows that Quint harpooned the shark four times. The movie only shows three barrels at the most. I have rewatched the movie, and this seems to be the case. The shark should have four barrels, not just three. What do you think? All the best, Chris. And then I had over at Instagram, at Book of Quint, David Kincaid wrote wrote in, uh, Hi Ryan, how many barrels were shot at the shark? Versus the three they show. I'm counting four total barrels that jumped off the orca after Quint shot, yet they only show three and only speak about three. Is this a continuity error? So uh, thank you very much for writing in, Chris and David. We are going to get to that. No, it is not a continuity error. This is a specific chain of events that happen, and you have to pay attention to the details in the movie Jaws to get to the answers. We're going to break that down right now. This is one of those uh, mysteries that you might lose track of, but if you watch what's happening closely, remember, before I jump into the movie here, remember that Steven Spielberg had an economy of shots and an economy of time for the orca sequence during that filming stage off of Martha's Vineyard. So there are many times that they would be filming, out, they filmed many times out of order. We learned from Marty Milner in episode 50 that they would have to sometimes shoot the shark they might want was damaged and they were repairing it. So they would have to shoot another sequence with another side of the shark or that, that would dictate on what shots could be filmed that day. There were also difficulties with sailboats and other pleasure craft coming into the field of vision. Remember, these the 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 movie has to have the orca and Quint Brody and Hooper out there alone and with the shark. So they would have uh, other curious boaters would come into the line of sight 
for the camera, they would have to clear them out or they would have to wait for a day sailor to be off the horizon. So many times they would run out of time or they wouldn't be able to get those pickup shots, those crucial pickup shots that might make the scene tighter. But with Verna Fields editing the film on site over at the, the Harbor View Hotel in Edgartown, they had an editing suite set up. They were able to communicate on exactly what was needed and what wasn't covered. And the sequence works if we look at the detail. It is not, it is not an egregious continuity error as it seems on its face value. So for this, I am going to jump right into the movie and we're going to, I'm just going to just, we're going to start right up at one hour and 36 Jeez. minutes into the movie. Put it, put it. Put your left hand down. I can't. It'll only go about three inches. All of our injectors okay. got scored from so the we have, water in the fuel. we have one barrel in the shark already and that has the Hooper's, uh, that has Hooper's SDU-5E strobe light on it. There it is. What do you say, Chief? The barrel is up. It's right in the stern. Okay, so at one hour and 37 minutes exactly, we have a beautiful widescreen shot of the orca on the left side. We have uh, Chief Brody up on the flying bridge. We have Hooper amidships, and then we have Quint at the stern. And they're looking at the lone yellow barrel, and we can actually see... We see the Neo Flasher strobe light that Hooper attached in the barrel sequence the day before. Uh, we do talk about that strobe light. If anyone wants to know about more about that strobe light, that's episode two of the Jaws Obsession. So, but for now, we know that here's our barrel and here we have the flasher. We can actually see that at one hour and 37 minutes into the movie as it, as it pops up at the stern. So we have to realize the barrel is sitting there Kind of motionless. Quint. If we can get close enough, okay. And what Quint, what Quint, what Quint is doing on, as, come on. as Quint, as Hooper's trying to hook in the uh, using the boat hook, he's trying to get in the line. Quint is studying this this line to see exactly okay. what the sh shark is thinking. When he runs, you drop that rope or you lose your hands. I seen fingers torn out of the knuckles. Oh, Seaman's home's full of them. Hey, boy, give it to me a minute. Okay, and then the shark appears. Now this startles Clint. Okay, so Quint is surprised here because the shark comes at an unexpected angle. So what Quint learns right here is the shark broke free from this barrel. The next line here is very important. So what have, what does Quint say after he gets his hand snapped and cut by the line? Haul in that line, it'll foul us. Haul in that line, it will foul us. Haul in that line, it'll foul us. Haul in that line or it will foul us, as the subtitles state. So what happens here is that there's two things that happen is that he knows that the shark has broke free from the barrel and that line is just drifting there. He also knows that the line in the water is a danger around the stern of any boat is that if it follows around the propeller, it paralyzes a boat. And this was one of those lines that led me in the writing of the book of Quint, is that Quint had some history with a situation that is similar to this. So now his first instinct is get that line out of the water as Hooper now is working hand over hand, and he's pulling to get that line clear out of the water and bring the barrel on board the orca. Hard in that line of the Start the engine! Where are you going? So now, as he says, where are you going? Hooper is seen with the barrel, with the strobe light barrel, uh, holding it on the stern of the orca. I'm going to make a phone call. Now, we lose sight of Hooper through this entire sequence Hello. right here. Hello. Hello, Mayday Orca. We have Brody, on the, we have Brody on the radio trying to hail Coast the Coast Guard. Guard. Do you read me? Quint grabs the bat. Coast Guard, this is the Orca. Do you... Now at this point we have the shot of Hooper is now he is on the 
he is at the bow of the vessel of the orca with the strobe light barrel. Okay, he's pushing it over as in he is going to do something with this barrel. Looks like he is going to reload that into the rack of barrels. This is the only shot we get. How does he get up there? If we watch carefully, as Quint is coming in to bash the radio and Brody is there, we do not see our back right here is to the a port side of the orca. So at this time, as all this chaos is going on, Hooper left Quint before Quint grabbed the back. Hooper left Quint and grabbed the line and the barrel and went and went along the catwalk along the side, the port side of the orca to the bow with that first yellow barrel. So as this is all going in, we finally get a shot of Hooper looking at the chaos that's going on inside the cabin of the orca, but he's on the bow. Now, what we, don't under, what we don't understand here is that Hooper is not merely watching this transpire. Excuse me, Chief. That's great! That's just great! Now we're going to get out of here! You're certifiable, Quint, you know that? Yeah. You're certifiable! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at this point, Hooper is actually doing something on the bow. What Hooper is doing is he is recovering his neo flasher strobe light his sdu 5e strobe light he's untying that he's getting that off the barrel okay in order because he's obviously figured out that they're in the daytime they're not going to be hunting at night and he doesn't need to they don't they won't need a visual on this barrel they have to get that now the shark is swimming around free with no barrels okay it's it's completely it's a barrelless shark at this point what would he do with that? He doesn't have time to necessarily put it back into the rack as he's recovering it. So what he takes with the barrel and he uses what my theory is, is he uses the flying bridge stowage area underneath the console. He just reaches up and throws that barrel over into the flying bridge and under, reaches down and slides it underneath the console of the flying bridge. If you think about this, when you're underway, you'd never put anything on the bow of a boat with it unsecured. He doesn't have time with the retri maybe the retractable device. He needs to, uh, he, he, he could put it back in there, but he wants to recover the SDU 5, 5E strobe light, the Neo Flasher strobe light. So he's going to take that barrel and throw it into the flying bridge. That's why we don't see that barrel right here, but we don't see what Hooper's doing up there. Now, the flying bridge stowage area theory holds up later on because we see in this sequence, I'm just going to fast forward. So we're going to leave there and we're going to come back to when Brody is on the Orca as it's sinking at one hour and 58 minutes into the movie. Brody is on the sinking orca. He just reaches to the side and grabs the M1 Garand rifle that is just stowed off to the side. Quint, obviously, during while Hooper was underneath the water in the cage, Quint loaded that rifle and put it up high and dry into the flying bridge area. And that, I think, is indicative that these guys, remember, the orca is not as big as we might think. If you look at the dimensions of the orcas, one thing I learned about in writing the book of Quint and my research with John Tedder, who is actually rebuilding the orca at orcarebuild.com, but look at the dimensions. It's not as large of a vessel as we might think watching it on CinemaScope. It's actually, you're able to jump around that vessel with ease. It's only 40 feet long and it's only 10 feet wide at the stern. So when Hooper goes up there, all he has to do is take that barrel and flip it right over and reach it over and throw that into uh, onto the deck underneath the console area if he doesn't have time to properly secure it and load it to the bow. So that's indicative when, when, when Brody grabs the M1 Garand from the, uh, from the flying bridge, that shows that this is an area that you can just quickly stash something and it's not really going to roll around up there. It might flop over, but you're not going to lose it per se up as up as you would up on the bow of the vessel where there are no sidewalls there where the gunnels are actually very small and you you would the barrel would just flop over and and get lost into the sea so that's what Hooper does as the bashing of the radio happens he's flipping the barrel over and he's throwing it into the flying bridge so he can recover that strobe light now pay attention because this is going to lead 
to one of the greatest Easter eggs in Jaws. Right now, we're, we're about to reveal this. As this comes out, as this, the flying bridge stowage area theory plays out, we're going to have proof that Hooper was on the flying bridge, bridge when he recovers the, the strobe light. But we don't want to jump ahead right there. We're going to go back to one hour and 38 minutes. You're certifiable, Quint, you know that? Yeah. You're certifiable! Yeah, 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 yeah. You're certifiable, but I'll tell you this! Oh, boys. I think he's come back for his noon feeding. So we see Hooper come up from the bow and watch how Hooper moves around the orca. He's using all the different levels and all the different steps. He is very, very quick and he's finding quick ways to jump up and use his arms to pull himself up using the support cables from the mast. And he's able to move around this orca very efficiently. Remember, he is from he has a sailing background. He's been on Transpacs, Transpacific Sailing. He was in America Cup trials. These guys are uh, they know vessels like the back of their hands, and they know how to move around with a vessel that's underway. Hooper takes to the orca as well as any first mate would. At this point in time, he says he I think he's come back for his noon feeding. Hook me up another barrel. Now Hooper jumps down. We only have four barrels in the rack. So remember, that first barrel is up in the flying bridge. And we are not privy to the flying bridge at this point. Even this tracking shot as we follow Quint and he moves along. He grabs the harpoon rifle. He does his little spin. He shuffles down to the end of the hunting pulpit. And as he fires that from the hip, he fires that dart. I want everybody to look, and that will be at 139 as he fires that dart into at 139 from the end of the pulpit. You can look in the back and you can see Hooper's scale. It is just barely above his waistline that he actually has reaching distance where if he wanted to, he could take a yellow barrel and reach down and just set it right into that flying bridge area. Okay, this is not uh, the, the flying bridge is not as large as people might think when you view this. But watch, look at the scales of everybody that involved. So here comes Quint. One barrel in. There it goes. Now we have one barrel goes out, three go up. So we have one barrel in the water. We have three at the bow in the rack of the orca, and we have one barrel in the flying bridge. Now it's the chase down. It's the hunting of the shark. It's it's a bit. It's the chase for the new first barrel. Five degrees port. And Quint already loads up himself another barrel. So he's on the hunting pulpit with All right, how you push? with a fresh harpoon loaded up to the next barrel in line. Now at 141, this is important now, this is an important sequence. At 140, 1 hour and 41 minutes, we have a second barrel, get, uh, second dart hits the shark, and Hooper comes back on the throttle. So the orca is now stationary. He dropped it back into neutral. A torso up of Hooper's back as he's in the flying bridge, you can see the orca is, his hand is on the throttle and it is in neutral. So as, as Brody is firing his uh, weapon and he is putting bullets into the shark, we lose track of Hooper. The second barrel pops up and we quickly see we have now two barrels in the water. We have two barrels in the rack. Mind you, we see Quint on the pulpit. We see Brody on the, in the working deck at the transom of the orca. And we do not see what Hooper is doing up in the flying bridge. Okay, so it's at this time, the two barrels go by. This was a crucial element, this, this part right here. The two barrels go by and you see Brody shake out the spent, uh, the spent cartridges, the used shells from his revolver, and he's going to load in some fresh bullets. This is the part that we do not, that, that there is a pickup shot that was missed. Okay. Two barrels go by. He shakes out the bullets. Now we cut to 
Quint coming back from the hunting pulpit, and we can see a third barrel right there. And we see Hooper is not at the helm, okay? Hooper is not at the helm. He does not have his hand on the wheel or the throttle. So in that, in between, while Brody is shooting at the shark, Hooper leaves, gets the barrel, rip the, it cuts the strobe light off, and then throws it, then jumps down with the barrel and throws it into the rack. For this shot right here, it's now three barrels in the rack. He puts that first barrel back in to make it three barrels in the rack at 141. Yeah, so what, what is remarkable about that scene, as Quint is working his way aft on the orca, he's coming at the camera, Hooper then steps into frame as he is now, he went around the port side, and now he is back onto the flying bridge. So Hooper leaves the helm to put that first barrel back into circulation, to put it back into the rack. Now we have three barrels on the front of the orca. So the famous shot right here. They're up again! Now what? Everything works. Two barrels now pop up in the water, and I have three barrels on the rack. We have all five barrels are accounted for. Well, why don't we start leading the shark into shore instead of him leading us out to sea? So all five barrels are accounted for at this point. We still have three barrels on the bow and two barrels in the water. So... Now that we iron this all out is that the uh, the flying bridge stowage theory holds up, that that's what Hooper was doing. He was recovering his strobe light. Why do we know he's recovering his strobe light? Because it's not on that first barrel that's in the rack, okay? He did something with that strobe light. Maybe it's in his pocket. Maybe he's tucked it somewhere in a compartment. But we do have proof. We have the best, one of the best Easter eggs in Jaws. If I was going to rate this Easter egg, it's definitely top three Easter eggs in Jaws. And we're going to reveal that right now. That many people overlook, and I overlooked it for years until I started doing this podcast, until I started diving into frame by frame and finding out more about Jaws. How do we prove that Hooper was on the flying bridge while Brody is firing bullets at the shark? How do we prove that Hooper is on the flying bridge recovering the Neo Flasher strobe light? This is great. For this answer, we have to fast forward. Out of my way. So we see Quint come from uh, forward. We see him, how fast he can even Quint in his advanced age. He actually can drop from the flying bridge down to the front, uh, to the bow, grab the greener harpoon rifle, hook up another barrel, uh, moving his way aft right to the stern, get out of my way, and he makes a great headshot, gets the uh, harpoon buried into the shark's head area. I remember there's a, the barrel hunting technique we talked about way back in episode three, Shallow Water, Jaws Obsession episode three, Shallow Water. We, we discuss how uh, Quint's main objective is to get the barrels attached to the head area of the shark because it is harder for a shark to keep its head down as the weight is on the head. Why he gets angry at Hooper because he's attaching the strobe light, it, it delays Quint from getting the headshot and he buries it into the back of the shark. And what happens is, is that shark then can carry that weight further because it's in the back. It doesn't have the, uh, the effectiveness of the barrel is maximized as you get a clean, as you attach it to the head area. Uh, and in tiring the shark out. So now Quint gets that third crucial barrel right into the shark's head area. And this is going to be uh, make or break at time. This is going to tire the shark out the most, having the barrel attached to the head area. So this is the third barrel goes into the water here. Make it fast! We got the lion in it! I can't! He's trying to run! So there's the third barrel, goes into the water, knocks Brody's glasses off, and I have two barrels on the bow of the orca. All five are now accounted for if we utilize the flying bridge stowage theory that we are breaking here on the Jaws Obsession on this episode 68 of the Jaws Obsession. Now the proof, 
that Hooper was up in there recovering his strobe light. The proof that as we don't see Hooper between uh, Quint getting that second barrel in and Brody firing bullets into the shark, Hooper is up there recovering his strobe light. The, for, to get that proof, the, uh, one of the ultimate Easter eggs of Jaws, we now have to go to the 1 hour and 47 minutes, 30 seconds into the movie. This widescreen image, remember, it has to be widescreen. You're watching the widescreen image of Quint at the helm uh, on the flying bridge. Hooper is to, the, his, to, to our left. Brody is to the right. And if you look very closely. How far do we have to go? On the very, on the very lower right of the screen. What do we see? What are we seeing on the very lower right side of the screen? Even as Quint starts singing farewell and adieu, and he's running the orca at max speed, we see the actual Neo Flasher label that Hooper pulled off his SDU 5E strobe light, and he just stuck it on the top of the spotlight right there on the lower right side of the screen. There's the waterlogged label that was on that flasher that obviously spent time in the water being on that first barrel. And as he recovered it, the label comes off. As we remember, those old labels, those old stickers would come off as they got wet. And he, would, he just took it and slapped it on that spotlight. I think it is the most brilliant example of continuity in Jaws that they act, that detail emerges that we don't even recognize unless you're looking for it, is that Hooper took the, the Neo Flasher label and he just slapped it right there on the spotlight. It's something to do because maybe it was just one of those instinctive things. He's got the thing and it comes off. He's got this flasher, pulls it off that first barrel and the, the label comes off and he just reaches up and put slaps it on the spotlight. It's just something I think that's so interesting that Hooper just did that. And it's something that we were not privy to. I think that if you went back and you talked to Steven Spielberg and at those discussions with Verna Fields, I think he really wishes he had uh, a pickup shot of Hooper loading that first barrel back in into the rack between that second barrel leaving the rack and Brody firing his weapon. A pickup shot was probably uh, that Spielberg was probably lamenting he did not get that pickup shot of Hooper loading. But we do see at that moment as Quint is coming back is there are three barrels now in there. And the so the proof is in the film Jaws, that Easter egg of the Neo Flasher sticker. And Hooper just slapped it right on the top. The sticker came off in his hand and he just slapped it right on the spotlight. It's totally uh, a remarkable continuity. Thinking about what these, what the filmmaker, what Steven Spielberg and the crew had to endure, the multiple shots, the multiple different pickup shots needed to make these sequences work on a big screen, the continuity is impeccable to think about the lighting, the sky, everything has to work. And I know there are continuity errors in Jaws. Every movie has them. But they are kept at such a minimum here that we are allowed to suspend our disbelief, and this becomes the greatest movie ever made. Remember, it's little things like this, and this is what I like. I, I like always seeing, um, uh, if I can relate personal experiences to this moment, is that um, as, a, as a lineman's apprentice, when I was uh, training to be, when you're, when you're trying to become a journeyman lineman working on high-voltage power lines, you are an apprentice. And as an apprentice, you quickly learn that you have to anticipate what your foreman needs in order to get the job done. A good apprentice will always anticipate before being asked. And that is what Hooper is doing here, is that he was working behind the, behind the scenes as Quint is worried about where the shark is and he's firing, he's firing harpoons. Brody had the, uh, he's got his, his revolver and he's shooting bullets. 
Hooper realizes that there is only two barrels left that he's got to, he has to reload that Quint might need all these barrels. So Hooper is working constantly to anticipate what Quint might need. And that's why he jumps down and loads that first barrel back into the rack to make it three on the bow as two are in the water. It's great because it's not highlighted enough that even though they butted heads earlier, that Hooper has become the ultimate first mate to Quint in that he is trying to anticipate and provide Quint with everything that he needs to make this hunt successful. It's a great moment, and that Neil Flasher sticker on the spotlight is the perfect Easter egg to tell us more to the story that's going on outside of what we see in the movie Jaws, that there is even there are even elements to these characters going on that we are not privy to. And that is what makes Jaws so special, is that we keep coming back and we keep finding these little elements to explain what we might have previously overruled as a continuity error. And it's not. Jaws is a very special movie like that. And I like that we know more about Hooper's mindset by seeing that st- that label on the spotlight. We know more about Hooper's mindset and as he has now assumed a first mate role to Quint during this expedition. I think that's great because a lot of uh, uh, we're always preoccupied with the butting of the heads, but it was after that, after that dinner scene, after the comparing of the scars, you see Hooper and Quint grow closer together. They're working on the engine together. Quint trusts Hooper to actually work on the engine of his vessel that he spent years on. And Hooper is also taking care of barrel management and making sure that Quint has what he needs in order to make this hunt successful. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. So world. So there it is. This this could have this episode could have been called Jaws Easter Eggs. Uh, because this is one of the ultimate Easter eggs, is that label on the strobe light. What do you think? Do you Can you see that strobe light as well as you watch the widescreen version? And also going forward, all you model makers out there, if you have the orca sinking, or if you show the orca post three barrels in the water, you're going to have to get a little mini SDU 5E strobe light sticker, and you're going to have to put it on top of that spotlight in order to show what moment you're portraying the orca. So we're we're always keeping you on your toes here over at the Jaws Obsession. It's great to have, and I want to thank everybody for your time, for listening to episode 68. Was it three barrels or four? We definitely know the answer now. It was four barrels, but one came off. And then they had to put three more in the shark. Thank you very much for listening. This has been episode 68, Three Barrels or Four. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. I had a little think about an hour ago. Where it's got right to my head. Wherever I may roam. By land or sea or home. Well, that was a special episode. I'm going to try to include photos and screenshots on our uh, show. We're going to actually have this sequence on the Telegram channel at our show notes, as well as screenshots over at Instagram at Book of Quint. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I especially want to thank Amberly Publishing for us. Uh, acquiring the book of quint for worldwide distribution Um, publication date is set for november 15th 2023 thank you very much to nick hayward and dave bowen nikki the managing editor over at amberly publishing as well as bill pettit over at the william pettit agency for making this all possible it's great to see the book moving forward like that The movie Jaws is copyrighted property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within Section 107 of the Copyright Act. Copyrighted materials are fairly used for the purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, and research. Materials used here are protected by the Fair Use Guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyright Act. All rights reserved to the copyright owners. Special thanks to John Tedder, 
You can go to Quint Sharkenshack over at Etsy.com. Find those links in the description of this broadcast. Thank you for him for coming on the show and helping us with this monumental occasion. Um, he has been a great presence on the Jaws Obsession, and we look forward to hearing from him more. So uh, orcarebuild.com and Quint Sharkenshack over at Etsy.com. Until next time, thank you very much for tuning in. Farewell and adieu and show me the way to go home. Thank you.